Hello, welcome to 30 Minutes. I'm Rick Anthony. It is my great pleasure to have as our guest today Radnor Superintendent of Police Chris Flanagan, who took the oath of office on May the 14th in the presence of over 200 of his closest friends at the municipal building. Uh, Chris succeeds William Calarulo, who retired from the position in, uh, on May 26th. Chris Flanagan, it's really good to be with you this morning. Uh, as, as I've said to you uh, in person, and I'll say again now publicly, anybody who knows you in this township and outside of the township knows that you were not only the logical, you were the best choice for this position. You know the township. The township has a tremendous relationship and rapport with you and your, your, uh, your colleagues at the Radger Police Department. Uh, to have chosen anybody else would have been an enormous mistake. Thank you. Uh, so really glad that you're in the position. Uh, what I'd like to do today in the time we have, uh, I mean, we visited before, I know there are some issues that are really of importance to you and importance to the community, but I'd like to ask you just four questions and in the context of those four questions, hit a number of points, a number of issues that again, some of which we've talked about before, but all of which are relevant today and going into the future. The first question is what motivated you to pursue a career in law enforcement? Then what were you doing before? It was 20 years ago. Uh, you're still a young man with uh, most of your life still ahead of you. What stands out in your mind as you look back over 20 years in law enforcement? What will law enforcement be in the next 10 years at the community level? Uh, because with the impact of technology and a number of other trends that are going on locally, nationally, and internationally, I can't imagine that things will be much as they are today. It's got to change. And finally, what are the top three goals you have now as uh, the top cop of Radnor Township? Uh, so are you comfortable with those four? I am. Oh, thought you might be. Uh, the, the list of points. Uh, let's go first, though, with um, uh, what motivated you to get into law enforcement. Thank you. I, I think it started with my father. He was a volunteer fireman in New Jersey. Uh, we moved uh, into Lower Marion Township in Marion. And I then, when I became 16, I joined uh, Norbeth Ambulance and the fire company in Norbeth. And I got, you know, my feet wet and it continued in high school. And I realized this was a career I wanted to do. I, I liked being involved in emergencies. Uh, when I came out of high school, um, I was able to get a job at the Burmore Fire Company mm -hmm. uh, that also serviced Radnor Township. So there's a little bit of a story and connection there. Um, and I worked there for seven and a half years while working there. Um, I still was able to volunteer doing emergency medicine and fire, but I started to meet the Radnor Township Police Department and saw what an awesome community this was. So one of the guys on one of the fire calls said, hey, why don't you take the test? So after talking over with my wife, I said, you know, there's a lot of opportunity. Um, you're getting to work more, respond to more emergencies. It's a very good setup for uh, longevity for your family, which is very important to me. So I ended up taking the test and was hired here in Radnor Township, and that took off to this 20 year point of being able to take all of what I've learned from my family, the values, emergency medical services, and firefighting, and then apply the new level of police career mm -hmm. and, and encapsulate emergency services, which is my passion. Did, did it ever occur to you early on that you might at some time in the future be wearing that badge? It, it has not. Uh, I did not come in to be that guy. I wanted to be a patrolman. I was very happy being on the street. I loved having a beat and knowing the people mm -hmm. on the beat, and that was one of the most rewarding things uh, that there was. But as you continue on and if you remain passionate, a lot of times you want to be involved in certain decisions, help make policy. So I started doing that, um, became a street sergeant, um, which they'll always tell you is the best job you can mm -hmm. have. and. Uh, once I was a street sergeant, I'm like, I want to compete for a higher position. Uh, became a lieutenant and deputy superintendent, and hence now uh, superintendent of police. Mm -hmm. um, but along the way, again, it's, it's your reputation as a leader and an innovator that uh, I'm sure was taken into consideration in selecting you as uh, Radner's top cop. Some of the innovations you've had over the past 20 years, the, the K-9 Corps, uh, the community police academy, and it, it goes on. W which of those stand out in your memory of your career? I'm extremely happy, uh, and I have to mention Jeff Stacy, uh, the gentleman who came to the township, said, "Hey, let's do this," and we were able to work hand in hand getting that done. But I, I think the Citizens Police Academy and reinvigorating Town Watch were some of the highlights mm -hmm. uh, that have gone on um, as far as bringing the community in. And the other one that I'm very proud of. Um, 
as the whole township accepted it is the police chaplains program because mm. what we're doing is we're bringing the community in with the police we're, we're working together hand in hand and I think that's critical in today's environment so that there's a level of trust prior to an incident happening. Mm -hmm. So you have to be proactive, not reactive. Mm -hmm. um, and the same model goes, do you want to have proactive policing so that if you all of a sudden have break-ins, you already have a plan or possible suspect? I think the same applies to our citizens and their sense of what we're doing, what we're about, and understanding how we have to respond to incidents. But it's a two-way street. The officers and the other people need to hear how our community interprets our actions as well. Mm -hmm. and. Uh, these have been some of the best projects we've been involved in in a long time. I, I've seen you in your motorcycle gear. You were a formidable figure <laughs> in that stuff. But w when did uh, Radner introduce motorcycles? And were you involved in that as well? We, we had always wanted to start. We, um, there was a, there's a history of them in the, mo uh, the motor unit. They did have them in the past. Then they were extinct for a while. Um, then we did get one motorcycle, but due to some staffing I issues, um, they disbanded that. And when Superintendent Colorado came in, um, him coming from the city of Philadelphia, who has one of the most elite motorcycle teams in the country, we reapproached him, and because of his access, he actually, in one phone call, was able to get us into their again elite training academy, mm -hmm. two-week program, and we were able to start the motor unit. I don't think any of us knew how successful it would be, but it's functional. It, it's able to provide police services. It's able to have rapid response. And I think, to be honest with you, though, the best thing about it is we, again, interact with the community. Mm -hmm. We just did the Memorial Day Parade, as you're aware. Yes. And the amount of people come up and thank you for riding and having the flags on the motorcycle um, is just unbelievable. And also, our officers will get stopped at the Wawa, and they'll say, oh, my son has a Harley. Yeah. Can mm -hmm. I take a picture of it, or you with mm -hmm. it, or me sitting on it? And it, it is another tool um, that's a significant connection to the community. People like motorcycles. How many do we have now? We have four donated motorcycles. So they were donated by uh, citizens and businesses here in you know Radnor Township. Mm -hmm. So that instills pride in our officers, knowing that somebody gave this to the community yes. and they are now in charge of it. So that's why they're, they're so clean and so impeccable. Are, are there other instances of, of citizens or the community donating equipment? Yes, the canine program um, is a significant change in police services that we're able to provide. And we approach the township. Um, I think people have connotations of what dogs can do. And we were able to sell the township on the need to protect. We have two bomb sniffing canines. They can also mm -hmm. track and they can also apprehend somebody if it's required. But these bomb sniffing dogs, um, we actually had the meeting just before the Boston attack. Mm -hmm. And we realized the need for it. And with our colleges, universities, and schools, I would say that we have a, a significant level of capability by having two police canines. They were donated by citizens of Radnor Township. And are they assigned to, I want to say handlers, I'm sure there's a better word, but the, the, the dogs were assigned to an individual who no, established... Canine handler, you're 100% yeah. right. There's only two officers, Officer Jen Coco and Officer Dan Lunger have both canines. It's only one officer's responsibility. Um, it's, a, it's a highly technical, advanced process. It's a very long school, a very dedicated school. They have to recertify every month in all the functions mm -hmm. that the canine does. If it does not, then it's not allowed to go on patrol until we find out what the problem is. Where are they housed? Or do, do they, they live with the, the handlers. They yep, they go back and forth with the handlers. Um, that keeps a humanistic side to the dog and the handler. It also keeps eyes on it. You know, if the dog gets sick, we want to be on top of it yeah. as well. So that has been another community uh, partnership with Radnor Township Police. You, uh, you mentioned the Citizens Police Academy. Uh, how many people have gone through that so far? We're, we're counting about 80, just about between really? 80 and 83 uh, have gone through it. Um, we're not the first police department at all to do it. We're kind of the last. And maybe that was a great thing because we had a lot of energy and um, the citizen who brought it to us, Jeff Stacy, he was a part of us. He went to every meeting we went to, visited mm -hmm. other police departments. We went all over the place taking the best ideas from every department, plucking them, fine tuning it to here, and then implementing it. And it's a two-stage process. It's not just a citizen's police academy. And first of all, I really hope that everybody viewing this program takes advantage of the annual program. And we only do it once a year just because it is a lot of work. It takes, uh, we have to adjust a lot of schedules to get it's it done. no cost to the residents. No cost to the residents. The township supports it. The board of commissioners, Mr. Uh, Zinkowski, support it 100%, which is a great thing. And there's no risk to personal safety. No. 
not at all. Is that correct? You do, you do take a ride in a police yeah. car, there is an element of a risk. Yeah. Um, this past year when officers were under attack uh, in Dallas, uh, we had two ride-alongs. We immediately made a call mm -hmm. to have them returned and exit the building mm -hmm. because we did not know what's going exactly. on. So there, there is a risk when you do the ride-along, mm -hmm. and we feel it's imperative that you do the ride-along. So you, you really get to see what goes on, see what you really can see, mm -hmm. what you can't see. It's a lot of perceptions, mm -hmm. and we really train um, our citizens in understanding the laws, our use of force, vehicle operations, all the specialty units, how the township works, and it's a lot of eye-opening information. People are changed, uh, Rick, after they do I'm this. sure. And, uh, You've had some of them on the show, and I think we interviewed uh, Mr. Stacy yes. as well mm -hmm. uh, early on. And then the great thing is it's also a feeder to our volunteer, mm -hmm. the Radnor Citizens Police Organization, RCPO. And this is a volunteer group of citizens who come out and help with us, work side by side with us. They did the Pope papal detail where they helped direct traffic. Our citizens were getting up at no cost to the township at four in the morning, helping come out and direct traffic and make it safe, um, give instructions to the people finding the train station. They work um, all the major events, the 4th of July, hmm. help with the parades. So um, they really are a valuable tool. And they also go out in the town watch car and provide a town watch function. And we really hope to see that expand. We want to see that grow so that there's an extra set of eyes on the street mm -hmm. as much as possible. We'll let it run 24-7 if they want it to. Now, how much authority does a, an academy graduate actually have with uh, directing traffic, for example. Sure. So the Citizens Police Academy, once you go through that, you're able to join the RCPO, which is the Town Watch and the Community Emergency Response Team, which is a federally based program where you learn how to handle emergencies. They don't have any police authority at mm -hmm. all. But what they do is they're able to assist us off the street. So only police officers can direct on the street. So they direct all the parking and all the things okay. on private property. So they're not actually physically directing traffic mm -hmm. on the street, but still a large amount of people come to park in an event. They help organize it, just like a, a staff services would be at a big Phillies game. They don't have police authority, but they're running the organization of the parking lot. It goes mm -hmm. a lot better because of their efficiencies. You know, what? a strange question just occurred to me. I asked about the authority of these volunteers. Uh, as a quick aside, how much authority, if any, do these flag uh, people have who are out d directing or redirecting traffic when their trees are being pruned. You know what I'm talking sure. about. Uh, at s certain times of the year, they're all over the place, for God's sake. And they seem to be controlling traffic flow. Are they empowered by Radnor Police to do that? So th th they are allowed to be out on the roadway and they have to they, use, they will call us and tell us there's some type of emergency or major work, and they are allowed to flag or control the flow of traffic. They are not police officers. Right. They can't give commands past kind of stop and go mm -hmm. or go into this lane for a matter of safety. So they're, they're, they're just based on that. Okay. All right. Um, any other thing that stands out over your 20-year career before we go into the future? I just think that... Um, our department has had a long history of being involved in the community and it's been instilled into us and I'm very grateful for the trainings from the past chiefs that I've received and senior officers and it's important to hand that down um, and keep passing it on to the new officers so mm -hmm. that they actually um, understand the true reason that you're a Radnor police officer. Mm -hmm. And it's more than just fighting crime, it's about being embedded in our community and, and getting the job done safely. Before we go on to the future, then, there's, uh, you and I have talked about this in the past. Is there anything particularly special about the way Radnor recruits, uh, selects, and onboards uh, new police officers that, that, that produces the kind of quality? As I told you, I've had some personal experiences in emergency response situations where, uh, in one case, two young officers came to the house. They, they couldn't have been more respectful, considerate, helpful, understanding, empathetic. And I thought to myself, Mike, where do you get special people like that? Where do you find them? I would say that we spend painstaking time and analysis on every candidate. A, a detective is assigned to go to your house, your neighbors, mm -hmm. go through your personal information and, and do as much investigative digging as a homicide would take we go all out. Mm -hmm. Then there's a, an elaborate interview process. There's a second interview with the township manager, which is, you know, very extensive to really find out how you are made and how you handle stress from questions. And then one of the biggest things that I think makes the difference is we have an ext 
I don't want to say extremely long, but it's a very intensive field training officer program, FTO, where they spend a lot of time really getting the philosophy mm -hmm. by doing the job and observing. It's phase one, observation only. They don't do anything. Two is then they participate where they're able to ask questions of the FTO. And then the third is we kind of pretend that we're not present, but we're in the car with them so nothing can happen and they follow them around. But you can't ask a question. If you need a question answered, you have to call a supervisor, another officer. You could put people on the street a lot quicker because mm -hmm. they're certified, mm -hmm. they, they're already training, yep. they have the skills, but it's not the skills. We're looking for the mindset and the true understanding of the philosophy of the police department. And that's where we spend a lot of time. And that time spent in the field training program pays us back long term, hands down. Yes. What what is the uh, tenure longevity of of most of the forty three officers you have? I think we have officers who have been here their whole life. I mean, we have officers uh, heading to their fortieth year in our department. Oh. There are some people who decide, hey, I want to go federal. So mm -hmm. we have some people who've been here short. We have a, but most of our officers stay for the long haul. Mm -hmm. You know, there are other people who change their minds. They're like, this isn't for me. No. And then there's other officers who, you know, want to go federal or go completely undercover task force work and they get to move on. But wherever they go, they're, they are uh, respected graduates of the Radnor Police Department. What I would say to your comment is, is that they are able to get newer or better opportunities yes. based on the reputation mm -hmm. of this police department. Uh, exactly. Okay, let's go to the future. Uh, impact of technology. Um, the, the, the new laws and regulations. Obviously, all the new threats that no generation before us, at least in modern history, has ever faced. 20 years, I'm sorry, not 20 years, 10 years out. What will policing at the community level look like? Will we be able to recognize it as we know it now? Will you be hiring the same kinds of people 10 years from now that you're hiring now, if only because of technology and the need to be more facile with technology? And the fact that technology is, is assuming taking over some of the tasks that are now routine parts of a police officer's uh, daily activity, I would guess. With all of that in mind, can you briefly, and not predict necessarily, but foretell what policing will be like at the community level. So at the community level, to some extent, I hope in Radnor they don't see any change. I hope that they see the same quality, some of the old school tactics and principles, mm -hmm. walking the beat, um, meeting people, going to community block parties, and um, just interfacing in a citizen's police academy. I hope it's going on in 10 years. So I hope some of the stuff doesn't change at all. In reference to new techniques, I think that um, Officers, the workforce is a little dictated by schools and, and how they come out as high school and college yes. graduates. So I think we, we will have to be adaptive to that. So, um, but so will the entire world. Well, you know, mm -hmm. the workforce will change and they'll, they'll adapt to the type of people that are coming out. There's no question that technology is definitely interfacing us. Right now we have automatic ticket readers. We have um, uh, automatic license plate readers. So you're going to have to be adaptive to technology more mm -hmm. and more. Um, we'll probably have tablets and everything. There'll be a lot less paper. Yes. So we'll see some of that. But I don't think we can get away from our core values. But what about the issue of surveillance, uh, drones, again, sensors, cameras everywhere? Uh, and, and that brings up the issue of the trade-off of personal sure. privacy sure. Now, and freedom. So that was the community policing answer where I think will be, some will change, but a lot hopefully yeah. won't. Now, in reference to technology and how it will address policing, um, one, we have to spend more time with our county and state partners because they have access to the latest and best technology. And there's new ways that they push information very quickly, so it helps us be much more adaptive to mm -hmm. a particular crime wave than in the past. So we will have to spend and invest time and money in sending officers to other events and networking in fusion centers that push this information out and also make sure that we're pushing our information to a fusion center, which will disperse it all across federal, state, and local. Mm -hmm. And that's a new thing that is going on already as we speak. Um, we're going to have to keep an eye on terrorism locally. I know it's hard to hear, but we yes. will have to do that. We'll have to spend a lot of time. We have to be tenacious on school safety. We, we cannot compromise on that. So that will be ever 
eventful, constantly reassessing, making sure that we're not missing anything, making sure that from a door that's always been locked for the last 10 years hasn't rusted out and it's safe to making sure that there's not new technology that we should employ to see if it can pick up a, uh, a subject's uh, criminal record when mm -hmm. they enter the school and swipe their license. So those are the type of things that we'll have to be very aggressive on. The other thing um, is training. With all this technology, we're going to have to um, embrace that and make sure that yes. our officers are able to train in the same pathway um, that everybody else is so that mm -hmm. they have the, the best tools to make them ready for whatever incident they come mm -hmm. upon. But of the, uh, the drones, the robots, again, in, as you know, in corporate America, when there's a, a shortage of labor as there is now, uh, companies, uh, even nonprofit organizations, look to technology to take the place of human beings. Again, 10 years out, do, do you, say, you see a significant displacement of, certain, of human uh, activity uh, replaced by robotics, drones, and so on because it's more cost effective? Uh, because it doesn't have to be maintained as human beings have to be maintained. And because in a sense, it's, it's almost easier to train them. You program them and that's it. So I, I think that there'll be more tools that'll be utilized and possibly general surveillance like over a parking lot that keeps getting hit that we'll have a piece of equipment that we can yep. drop off, set up, and now we won't have to have an officer sit there. You could have some mm -hmm. live time where we could monitor five parking lot as opposed to having five officers and five individual ones. So I think that will change. The one thing is that, in my opinion, the criminal activity, you still have to have an officer who can think on their feet, assess yeah. all that technology, but then put it into humanistic terms and create an action plan based on that. So if we have guys breaking into cars, we can use technology to reduce the amount of officers to monitor, mm -hmm. but there's going to have to be an officer processing that information and then sending officers in a response pattern mm -hmm. to that and to make uh, rapid decisions. Do you see in the next 10 years a, a trend towards uh, uh, more regional jurisdictions because of cost, M maybe a consolidation of some police departments covering larger areas? I think that it's a possibility in Delaware County. Some of the smaller agencies uh, may consider that. I think in some of the other surrounding counties, um, the tax base and the, and the political structure, they want their individual police departments. They mm -hmm. believe in that. They believe in their community. So I think you'll see some changes, but I don't think you're going to see dramatic changes. But, but, uh, has, but hasn't that happened with fire and other response, emergency response there's, uh, services? Oh, now one or more regional rather sure. than... Sure. So on a response, so... On the smaller scale, I think police departments in particular in bigger townships and solid tax bases are going to remain fairly set the way mm -hmm. they are. Much smaller areas or boroughs may have to regionalize. In other words, every day is all blended together. What you do see differently immediately now in police and fire services and EMS is they have major response plans that are put into yes. play. Used to only be for the big ones. Now we're saying even that mid-size incident, let's get more people, more resources there. Um, just like we may move the county, Delaware County's radio truck uh, to a medium-size incident here, that has a drone inside of it, capable dispatchers and other things. Mm -hmm. So we're already seeing a difference in regional response. Um, we're not all trying to do it on our own. We're working together more hand in hand. Uh, within the next 10 years, uh, given the terroristic threats and so on, and the need for constant vigilance. Uh, do you see more corporate hospitals, schools, other institutions, large corporations uh, hiring their own private security forces with whom you will interact? I think it's a, a extreme likelihood. We already have a school in the township that has armed security in right. it. Um, for the first time ever, we were approached by a church recently to ask about it or mm -hmm. to ask about hiring a police officer for their day of service. So that is going to be have to something we're going to have to be very fluid with. There are other districts and other grants where they can hire officers who are armed but don't have the arrest powers. They'll still leave that up to the police, but that will provide immediate response mm -hmm. in there. I think it's a case-by-case -case basis. We're very we want to move very carefully and slowly to make sure we're doing the right thing and the right measures for the, the right problem. But most of those will be private security? They would be security, private, yes. Right, with whom you will interact. Correct. Will, 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 will Radnor Police Department, Radnor Township, have to certify or otherwise authorize uh, those individuals to perform in Radnor Township? 
No, at this point in time, no. If you, they, there's a cert, sure. Yeah, there's yeah. a cert, cert Security Clearance Act 235, which people can okay. obtain, and then they could provide certain level of services. Mm -hmm. If it came into the fact of arrest powers, then they would have to be certified um, and acknowledged by the state mm -hmm. um, to do that. So there's a couple of different things. You, you mentioned earlier, I think you said, uh, you used the word proactive. Um, again, looking to the future, uh, the Radnor Police Department is proactive, has been proactive uh, through communications, through everything you've talked about. There's, there's, a, there's a high touch as well as high tech approach to law enforcement. Uh, but are there other ways that Radnor Police over the next 10 years, for all the reasons we've discussed, have to be even more proactive, more preventive, rather than reactive, that is being prepared to respond quickly, as opposed to, well, we could have avoided that, we could have prevented that if we had more information, faster information, better technology, more cooperation, you, you know what I'm talking about. Or, or is all of that infrastructure in place to become more proactive? So I, I would say that one of the goals, the future goals, would be to, to possibly have a Homeland Security slash intelligence officer who hmm. on a full-time basis is analyzing, assessing, and communicating with these fusion centers um, with the information and then deciding what information we should send out. We get inundated with emails about stuff that's happening all over the place, and it's important, but sometimes it can be overwhelming having somebody who just focuses on certain things and is always evaluating um, and assessing our emergency action plans and other things mm -hmm. would be a goal of something that I'd like to have in the future here at mm -hmm. Radnor Police. Okay, uh, your three top priority goals for three. the next few years of your... Absolutely. Uh, the three premium. top priority goals um, is to meet and communicate with my staff. Make sure that they have an understanding of our mission. Um, Radnor Police Department is in a great uh, position as Chief Collarulu left. We want to make sure that they have a clear understanding of the goals that mm -hmm. the Township Manager and the Board of Commissioners have and our community expectations and understanding their job. Second um, is to empower our sergeants um, because they are truly the focus where our workforce, our main workforce, gets their information and understands. Mm -hmm. So the sergeants need to be very clear on the mission of the organization and, and what the expectations are so they can disseminate that to their police officers. Um, and then the last uh, would be our connection with the community. That is my top priority, um, to make sure that we're reacting to the needs that they have. It, it's mm -hmm. a broad statement that can mm -hmm. go on and on. But, for example, I know that the schools in our community need us to be there for them. They need us to be mm -hmm. highly interactive, make sure they're safe, mm -hmm. and do as much as we can to attempt to prevent a disaster. So that would be one thing. We want to make sure we're in touch with our commissioners and yeah. the issues that they have in their respective wards. They're all different, mm -hmm. even though it's one township. And then um, in closing, just from whether it's this police department or anywhere, I want our officers to come home safe. Yeah, amen. Uh, immediately after this program, you start your own program. That is correct. Uh, you're going to be, uh, the subject is going to be school safety. Correct. Couldn't be anything more important these days. That is, that's very, very important to and, everyone. And you're going to have some guests. We're excited about the panel we have coming in. Uh, we have a, the superintendent of schools for Radnor School District, Ken right. Batchelor, uh, director of emergency services for Delaware County, uh, Mr. Tim Boyce. And we have a private school partner, um, their chief financial officer and security manager, mm -hmm. uh, Tim Walsh from Agnes Irwin School. So I think we're bringing some subject matter experts yes. to the table and uh, really let the community know what we're doing. And this will be the first in a series of programs that you will host here at Radnor Studio 21? That is correct. We're going to try and get the information out that we think people want to hear about and uh, keep them informed. That's great. It's terrific. Thank you so much. My pleasure. Thank you. Again, congratulations. Uh, thank you for your service to the township and, and your, uh, your colleagues. They do a magnificent job. Until next time, uh, this is 30 Minutes. My guest today has been uh, uh, Superintendent of Police Chris Flanagan, Radnor Township. Um, he's got a big job and he needs your help. Uh, so check the website to see the programs that are available for involvement, engagement of residents of Radnor Township. Uh, I'm Rick Anthony. This is 30 Minutes. Take very good care of yourselves.